Uh, nice being here with you guys today. Uh, I come from the U.S. and it's the middle of the night for me, so I'm kind of like, ah, I'm awake, I'm awake, right? Um, but I wanted to come to you here today and basically talk to you about something a little bit different. And I'm going to have some Ruby code inside this presentation, but um, it's going to take me a little while to get there. And I think you're going to see why as we uh, march forward with this. Um, how many people have ever programmed in the C programming language? Dozens. No, wow, almost everybody. That's incredible. That's great. Um, it's very funny to me that, um, you know, in the industry, it's like we make assumptions all the time about what people can do and what they can't do in terms of programming. We make these assumptions about how uh, some things are extremely difficult and other things are kind of like they're easy and that sort of thing. And um, I think it really kind of inhibits us a great deal within the industry. And um, uh, as a result, we just end up basically not writing programs that are as powerful as they could be or uh, something along those lines. So let's go ahead and take a look at something here. Okay, you guys understand what this code does? Yeah, Fibonacci sequence, right? So everybody here who programs C knows what this is, right? Even people who don't program C, you've probably seen enough curly brace languages to get a sense of how this sort of thing works, right? Now the thing that's really kind of funny to me about this is that if you try to show this stuff to a non-programmer, to them it looks like complete gibberish, right? It looks like crazy nonsense. Stuff that, you know, they look at you like you're a rocket scientist because you're able to do this fascinating thing with computers and it all seems like voodoo and magic to them, right? And if you try to explain to non-programmers how this stuff works, you know, you end up having to go and explain all these concepts like that essentially there's like this big sheet of memory and stuff like that and this memory is like broken down into cells and everything and that, you know, every one of your variables, you know, has a certain number of blocks of memory associated with it and they all have addresses and things like this. And then it's essentially you have to explain things like, wow, there's a flow of control, so things kind of go from the top to the bottom, except when you have like loops, then you have to kind of like cycle up to the top of the loop and then go down and stuff like this. And when you think about it, these are an incredible number of concepts you have to get across to somebody who's no non-programmer, right? And, um, you know, we kind of forget how much we really know about programming, right? All of us have basically picked up all these things and run with them, and we basically over and over again have... Uh, push ourselves into this zone where we feel stupid and then we feel much better because we have learned something that we didn't know before, right? Now, the thing about this, well, that's the shock to non-programmer that you're explaining these things to, right? So we forget about how much abstraction we currently can handle. And um, I think this is really a shame because the thing is that really there are far more powerful modes of abstraction within the industry still that people are not really facile with. And um, to the degree that we can actually move towards those things, we can basically make things much better. So what about this? Lisp, right? Anybody here ever play with Clojure at all? Or even common Lisp or something like this, right? So we're seeing a resurgence now of the Lisps basically uh, because of the uh, impetus of Clojure. And uh, over and over again you'll basically find people in the industry who've been programming in C and in Ruby and all these other things and they decide to go and take the plunge. They decide to go into a language like Lisp and play around with it and they find that, wow, you know, this thing is way more powerful and I have this wonderful set of features and it's like, and basically, articulate my solutions in an extremely concise way, right? And they get really happy about this sort of thing. Has this ever taken off? Has the Lisp ever become like a mainstream language? No, right, and what's, why not, right? Well, there's two things. Quite often people get put off by the parentheses. They look at the parentheses and they're like, oh, there's no syntax, that's crazy, uh, everything's a Lisp, what am I gonna do, I'm gonna freak out. Um, and also there's this kind of sense that, um, that the mainstream programmer can't really do this sort of thing, okay? That this is just too much for the mainstream programmer. And this has held us back for years and years and years. Um, the key idea in functional, which kind of differentiates it from any other paradigms in a way, is you can take functions and pass them to other functions, right? And I think that somewhere early on, people got the idea that that was just too much for your average programmer to handle. And if you want to go and get an indication of that, I mean, look around at how many languages just now are adding closures and lambdas to them, right? C is adding, you know, closures, you know, it's adding lambdas and C++ is. Java, finally, C Sharp has had them for a while. And these are really, really old concepts. These are from like the 1940s and 50s, right? These concepts, even if they weren't like rendered in programming languages immediately. But the thing is, we have this thing of going and believing that these things are just like way too powerful, too rocket science, computer science for the mainstream programmer to go and handle. And um, I don't know how many of you guys were programming in the 90s, but in the 90s, one of the things I found fascinating was that there was this assumption, you know, that uh, there's only so much that programmers can handle, and you saw it all over the place in the languages that people were using. Um, anybody know this guy at all? Alan Kay? 
Right, okay, and then what's funny about this is that he basically came up with a lot of the foundational concepts of object orientation. He kind of pushed them early on. He was the impetus behind the small talk programming language where everything is an object all the way down. And, um, you know, what do we see now? We essentially see objects, you know, over the place. People in Java are using objects over the place. And even for things that just seem like very mundane, they're using objects. The thing I think is kind of funny about this is that back in the 90s and stuff like this, there were a lot of people that were procedural programmers from back in the day, and there was this thought that if you were a procedural programmer to actually go ahead and change your paradigm to object orientation was a very, very painful thing to do and that you wouldn't be able to make it. And in fairness, there were a lot of older programmers or programmers that just weren't kind of, uh, how can I say, just really digging in. They just didn't really make it. They stuck to procedural languages and they just never really got object orientation. And they kind of self-selected out of the industry. But there, you know, the vast majority of people just sort of made the transition. They went from procedural programming to object-oriented programming. And right now we're seeing that same kind of thing happening with functional. A lot more people are looking at Haskell and hybrid languages like Scala. There's functional things you can do in Ruby and stuff like that. And again, people are thinking, it's like, oh, this is too hard. And then some people are going to go and start marching into it and other people will kind of fall off. Um, but anyway, I wrote this thing up a couple of years ago, which I thought was kind of, uh, it was an observation I made that <coughs> it seemed like in the 90s we had this thing, I called it like the era of patronizing language design. And you could see this over and over again in the different languages that were developed back then. Java, for instance, basically isn't as powerful as it could have been because there was this feeling that, hey, mainstream programmers can't handle sorts of certain sorts of things. If you want to see an example of this, it's like you know all of the metaprogramming stuff that we do inside of Ruby that we take for granted, being able to modify classes at runtime and stuff like that. Well, in Java, they gave us reflection, but it was really pretty much read-only reflection, right? You can go and access things at runtime to see what's going on with things, but you couldn't modify classes at runtime, right? And people were terrified of that because they thought, oh my God, if you give your programmers the ability to modify classes at runtime, they'll have a complete ugly mess, and it'll be hard to understand what's going on. And we know that that doesn't happen, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> well, here's the thing that's funny about this, is that essentially it does happen, right? But then the thing is, like everything else in life, it's self-correcting, right? You have people basically doing scary, scary things with metaprogramming, and then people start looking and saying, whoa, that's too much. It's time to go and ease off on that sort of thing. And we've seen that in the Ruby community, right? There have been a lot of, like Rails was terribly metaprogramming happy, and still is to a degree. But it's like, you know, you start to go and figure out where in your project you want that sort of thing and where it's going to cause you trouble, right? And, um, yeah, it's just kind of amazing that that sort of thing happened. Um, I don't know if anybody ever heard of this language. There's a language called Aspect J from back in the day. And um, there was this thing that some guy had come up with, uh, Gregor Kixawas. He called it Aspect-Oriented Programming. And what it was was basically a new set of concepts back then to go and describe how you could go ahead and sort of like annotate methods so that when you run a method, it's going to run certain things before it runs and certain things after it runs, right? And it's like, we can just, we can do that, you know, easily within Ruby, just, you know, hacking it together in five, ten minutes, right? But he came up with this notion of weaving aspects into your program and sort of like touted it as a, a new paradigm. And the thing is, he went through all this trouble to go and create a new programming language and this new concept of aspects and advice and all this other stuff in order to go and basically protect people from the notion that you could modify classes. So this is kind of patronizing when you think about it. It's like the sense that the average programmer can't handle these particular concepts. And what I think is wonderful is that in Ruby, it's like Matt's gave us all this capability, and it's like people went in there and they started to play. And they just started doing things and doing things and doing things. And sure, some people overdid things, but at the end of the day, basically people were able to go and you know, do some very satisfying things and do some very powerful work that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So I think we really sort of shortchange ourselves when we do this sort of thing. Um, and I want to point out something else as well, is that you know, when you look at studies of um, programming languages and productivity and quality and stuff like that, one of the things that seems to come up consistently is that if you're able to go and basically make a program smaller, its quality is higher, okay? If you're working in a higher level abstraction language, um, essentially what it comes down to is that basically bugs correlate with lines of code, right? So it feels like we get this quality benefit if we're able to go and form very concise solutions to things. And I'm sure some of you have, who've worked in other languages like C or Java have had that experience of working in Ruby and discovering that something that would take you 100 lines only takes you about 20 lines or something like that in Ruby, right? You get that power by using a higher level of abstraction in Ruby. And the fact of the matter is we still have further to go with that, right? Um, here's a teeny little program in Haskell. I don't know how many people have ever worked in Haskell at all, okay? Very interesting language, but one of the things that's kind of neat is that you can use these very powerful abstractions and chain them together in order to go and do massive amounts of work. 
Um, what this thing does is it basically takes um, a set of strings and it breaks them into words. And what it does is it takes the first word of every string and puts them out in sequence, and then the second word of every string and puts them in sequence, and the third word in every in every of those strings and puts them out in sequence. And it all happens in a line of code, right? It's just kind of fascinating that you can kind of just tie all this stuff together in a very concise way, very powerful stuff, right? Um, and in Ruby, we can do very similar things too, right? Um, here's a little piece of a program that I wrote, you know, a while back to go and do some source code repository analysis in Git. And um, I don't know how many here have worked in like you know .NET, right? And you've seen that there's like link expressions where you can go and use form these queries using functional programming constructs and stuff like that. Um, here's an expression in Ruby that goes and rips through an array and basically goes and gets me all of a particular type of uh, things, these things I call method events, uh, correlated by committer per day. And uh, it, when I look at this code, I'm kind of like, wow, if I was doing this in like Java, it would be, you know, dozens and dozens of lines to go and just do this kind of thing, right? But um, I'm not going to explain this one as it stands, but this is just a very functional style of programming, right? You go to an array, you do a group by on it, you get the values, you map, you flatten, you break it into pairs, you do frequency histogram based upon it, you do a sort by. I mean, how many people have like really looked into enumerable in Ruby? I mean, enumerable is your friend, right? It has such powerful functional abstractions. Just to understand how group by works will basically change your programming life, right? It's a great, great you know tool to go and basically do lots of cool things. Um, so yeah, we. We can do this. We can basically go ahead and program at much higher levels of abstraction, right? And we get a benefit. We basically get higher quality software doing this kind of thing. Um, anybody know what this is at all? <laughs> what is it? APL, okay. Um, anybody ever heard of APL, other than the guy who just raised his hand and said APL, right? A couple of people have heard of APL, right? This is one of the most maligned programming languages ever written, right? <clears throat> and it was not written as a joke. It was written uh, by a mathematician. So, well, that could mean it was a joke. I don't know. <clears throat> but it was um, you know, designed in the 60s, 70s. Uh, the, uh, it was actually designed as a programming, as a, as a notation for mathematics, first and foremost. And then they decided to go and basically make a programming language out of it. And I think Lisp had very much the same thing. Right? You had the church, you know, the Lambda Calculus, and then somebody said, let's write an interpreter for this, and then you have a programming language. The thing that really kind of freaks people out about APL is that it uses a character set which is not the ASCII character set, and not the, you know, it uses these really funky symbols, and a lot of them are like Greek symbols and stuff like that. And when you look at them, it looks like Martian, doesn't it? It looks like a crazy, crazy language. And um, so people look at this and say, this is unreadable, this is nonsense. You know, sure, you can get people to write it, but then who can read it? Kind of like Perl, right? But no, worse than Perl, right? So it has that kind of quality to it. But I have this feeling, I have this strong feeling that essentially, you know, we are seeing a long trend in the industry towards more concise programs at higher levels of abstraction. And when you think about it, there's no other place to go, right? If we're going to go and basically raise the bar in an industry, we have to move towards more concise programs to go and basically go make bigger things. And I think as well that we, as I said in the beginning, we're underestimating our ability to learn new things and to go and think at higher levels of abstraction. So anyway, this is APL. What's this? This is a language which is so hard that several billion people use it every single day, right? I mean, when you think about it, right? It's like, do you, you know, you look at this and this is gibberish to you, right? So you're looking at this and saying, wow, it's like, how could anybody possibly read this? How could anybody possibly work using this language? It's probably the same feeling you have about APL, right? But the fact of the matter is it's all a matter of what we're used to, right? And if you become used to different things, then you can go ahead and sort of like, you know, take advantage of that expressiveness, the communica communicativity, that power, right? So another APL program. Um, APL stands for A Programming Language, which is kind of a very clever, almost Monty Python-like, you know, uh, thing. It was developed by a guy named Ken Iverson. And um, here's a quick sort, okay, in APL. Actually, quicksort in J, which is an APL derivative. Okay? Do you get it? <laughs> Frankly, neither do I. Okay? Um, but this basically shows you how concise things can be. Here's the funky thing about this. You'll notice that basically there are no variables in this. Okay? And this is kind of funny. If you remember that little piece of Haskell that I showed you a little while ago that had the baby on top of it and it had 
it had no variables either. It was just it was just basically function calls, right? And um, it's kind of like you know if you're working this functional paradigm, you can basically go ahead and quite often write programs where basically you're just going and dealing with the actions that you want to perform, and you don't even need to name variables because it's kind of implicit the way things are kind of strung together. And that's what's going on in these APL derivatives, is that essentially you have a program, you don't really have to go and name the variables because um, the way the language is constructed, the way things compose together, it's kind of like you pass something in one end and it kind of chains down into a series of calls and you just have powerful abstractions that allow you to do cool things. So that's quicksort. Um, what I want to do now is basically go and give you a little bit of a flavor of this language called J, which is an APL derivative. And then I'm going to go and tie Ruby in, just so, because this is a Ruby conference, right? Okay, cool. All right, um, so this is, I'm going to show you a little bit of J, okay, and just what some of its power is like. Um, this is the factorial function using the exclamation point, right? So a factorial of one is what? It's one, right? A uh, cool thing is that that function, one, we can apply it to, excuse me, that function factorial, we can apply it to one like that. We can also apply it to just basically an array. So if we do factorial of three, four, five, we get 6, 24, 120, right? And this points to something which is rather powerful. This is the, the powerful idea behind these APL derivatives. The powerful idea is that everything is an array, or everything is a, a piece of data which can have arbitrary dimension. And what you find over and over again is that you have operators that will work on something, with it, whether it's a, a scalar, like a single number, or a simple array, or a matrix, or an n-dimensional matrix. It doesn't matter. You have that operator that goes and sort of applies to it regardless of the dimension of the thing you're working on. And that's really, when you think about it, it's a different kind of polymorphism. I mean, we're used to, you know, duct typing and polymorphism in Ruby. This is a different kind. It's polymorphism across multiple dimensions. So we have that factorial. And um, we have this other operation here. Um, essentially, this is to go and basically create data of a particular shape, okay? Here I'm basically saying I want to create a two by two array and fill it with ones. And so it looks like this. That's what gets printed out in J. Okay? And you can also do something like this. I want a two by three array and fill it with ones. Right? So what else can we do? We can create a two by two by two array and fill it with ones. And this is how it prints out in J. Essentially, you know, you can look at this as being two squares, but in essence it's a cube, right? It's basically a three-dimensional thing, right? Um, as well, you can basically go ahead and create sequences like this. If I say i.4, it goes and gives me the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you can do something like this. You can say, give me a 2 by 2 matrix, filling it with the sequence 0 to 4, or 0 to 3. And so it just goes and fills in things that way. So a lot of very powerful array operations to go and just sort of you know, organize things in memory. Um, here's the funny thing. So we're creating a 2 by 3 matrix. And we're filling it with zeros and ones, because i.2 is going to basically be 0, 1, right? What happens is that when you're filling up this multidimensional thing, it takes that sequence on the right, and it goes and repeats it if it gets to the end of the sequence. So it's going to say, oh, I'm filling a 2 by 3 thing. I'll fill it with a 0, and then a 1, oh, at the end of the sequence. So I start with 0 again, 1, and just keeps on filling and filling and filling like that. So you can create, you know, just rich pieces of data like this sort of thing. Um, what about this? Let's create a 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 by 12 matrix, filling it with zeros and ones. No! Right, OK. The thing is, the language will allow you to do this. You can have arbitrary dimension to your matrices, right? It's just a question of whether your runtime is actually going to allow you to allocate that much stuff, right? That's where you get into trouble, right? So dimensionality is like completely free. You can have as many dimensions as you want to for the data that you're working in. Um, so here's something cool as well. Uh, this is how you sum up numbers, okay? So you see the plus sign over there? Okay, that slash right next to it is kind of like a fold operator. They call it insert. What that means is basically everything we have on the right-hand side, we're gonna take a plus and put it between each one of those elements, kind of like a fold would be, or like a reduce inject in Ruby, right? So we basically go ahead and take zero to five, we sum them all up and we get 15, all right? Um, what does this do? Three by three matrix, filling it with twos. And we're basically going to do a sum, okay? Now here's the thing which is kind of cool about this. If we have a three by three matrix, okay, and we basically sum it up, essentially it's a two-dimensional thing, right? 
And essentially, if we sum it up, we're going to basically just roll up one dimension. So we're going to sum across one dimension, and we end up with a, a vector. We've taken a two-dimensional thing and reduced it to a one-dimensional thing. Can I see what's going on? And that's because we've done that fold on just one dimension. So if you do a sum of vectors like this, if you have a, um, a five-dimensional thing and you do a sum, it's going to convert it to a four-dimensional thing. You do another sum, it's going to convert it to a three-dimensional thing. You keep on reducing things down along that way. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, I don't know if you're visualizing this or not, but it's like that's, you know, if you, once you start to visualize things in that way, you can see that this is a pretty powerful way of organizing, you know, uh, data and doing things. Um, this right here, we're doing that again. We're basically going and summing twice across, you know, one dimension and then the other. And so we basically end up having our three by three thing filled with twos. The entire thing sums up to 18. Okay. So... Here's another thing, and it points to something which is really cool about, uh, about J, this APL derivative, that um, uh, the compositionality of the syntax is really kind of neat. This is an operation called grade up, and what it does is it takes a, a sequence like this, like a vector, and what it does is it goes and gives you the position each one of those elements would be in if it was sorted. Okay? Yeah. Now, you're looking at this and you're saying, geez, what madness, what total madness, right? And I looked and I thought, what the hell is that for, right? But here's the thing that's really cool about this. When you dig deep into APL and J, what you discover is that there's, there's, uh, there's a reason for these things. What he was trying to do is very much like um, you try to find fundamental things you can build bigger things out of, right? And we know that that's a powerful thing in computing. It's like when you look at Lisp, it's the idea that everything is a list and it's like you can read set things up so that basically maps and folds are primary and then everything else builds on maps and folds. Those are very powerful ideas. So here we have this operation grade up, which basically goes and gives you that. And um, we have this, which is sort. So we put a little tilde after that, and that basically means we're just going to sort those elements. So that's nicer for us, right? We have grade up, and we have sort. One thing I want you to notice with this is like even though we're using funky characters, there is a little bit of uh, niceness to it. See the forward slash? Doesn't it look like we're sorting upward? Kind of like, you know, it's like we've got a ramp going upward, right? That's what this, that kind of thing implies. Um, here's the trick with this. When we um, do this particular operation, a grade up, we get all the positions that, we would, that these things would be in if it was sorted. And each of these operators that you have in J can basically have a left-hand um, argument and a right-hand argument, or just a right-hand argument. It's, they, they call it this crazy terminology, they call it monadic and dyadic forms, right? So if you basically go ahead and use it as a unary oper operator, that's called monadic. If you use it as a binary operator, they call it dyadic. But here's the thing, that grade up operator, when you basically use it as a dyadic form, the left-hand side, if you give it the positions that you want, and you give it something on the right-hand side, it basically puts everything that's in the right-hand side in the positions that are on the left-hand side. So this is basically the same as doing a sort. I take the position array, and I apply it to the other array, and that puts everything in that particular sequence. Okay? So the trick with this, the thing that's kind of funny, is that when you have this right here, the tilde on that, what that's basically saying is like saying, take this right-hand argument, apply the grade up to it, put it, that result on the left-hand side, and then basically use it as a dyad. Has your mind exploded yet? <coughs> okay, pretty damn close. But the idea for this really is to go and sort of like have these powerful higher order function things that allow you to compose things together in very interesting ways. And that's part of the thing which makes this an extremely powerful language is that once you get the hang of these things, you can sort of write very concise you know, programs to go and solve big problems. Um, like this. Okay. Conway's life. How many lines of code does it take, con take to write Conway's life in Ruby? This is what it looks like in J. Okay, the J programming language. And um, yeah, kind of funky, isn't it? Um, I don't, sorry? Where does it start reading this? Exactly, exactly. And I, I can't, I'm not versed enough in J to read this one yet. I really am not, right? Okay, and so I'll, I'll say more about that a little, in a little bit later. But here's the thing about this, which I think is fascinating, is that, um, uh, I don't know, there, there's, I'll, I'll tell you more later, but um, the way that this is done is the thing which is utterly fascinating. Um, there's a great YouTube video, okay, that basically goes and shows this being done in APL. And the thing that I think is most fascinating about it is the way that it's done. Um, 
So everybody knows how Conway's life works pretty much. You count the neighbors around each one of the cells in the grid, right? And for if you have a dead cell and you have a certain number of neighbors, then it becomes alive. If you have a, a cell that's either dead or alive, if it has a certain number of, of uh, neighbors, it stays alive, or you know, if it was alive, right? So the way to go and calculate the neighbor count of these things, if you've ever written Conway's life, you know that you're sitting there, it's like, oh, it's like, okay, I've got my point, and we go and see what's at x minus one and y minus one, x plus one, and you know, and you're going and doing that, and you have that funky little thing, and then you got to deal with the edge conditions and all that other crud, right? In Conway's life, when you're writing in APL or in J, what you do is you basically sort of do a thing called a rotate, which is kind of like a shift, right? Imagine a Ruby array that has like zero through three, okay, zero, one, two, right? And you do a, a rotate. That's going to go and basically turn it into um, it's going to turn it into one, two, zero. It's kind of like a rotate around, right? It's kind of like a, a wrap around shift, right? And essentially, what happens in the ver APL version of Conway's life is you take the center grid that we have here, which is essentially just like our seed value. And what you do is you basically go ahead and shift it up, you shift it down, you shift it to the left, shift it to the right, shift it diagonal this way, this way, this way, this way, right? You end up with these nine squares that basically have the central position and the position shifted in each one of the different directions. And then you take all these things and you stack them on top of each other and you sum down through them. Okay? And when you do a sum down through them, what you get is the count of all the neighbors around that particular point, including that point. And then you can do things like anding those together and stuff like that to go and find out. It's like, oh, if it's three, it means one thing. If it's four, it means another thing. And that's how you solve the problem, right? Would you ever in your life imagine solving a problem that way, right? And that's because you're not APL programmers, okay? And that's fair, right? But here's the thing is, that I think is wonderful about this, right? Um, my personal passion in this industry is I feel that the, 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 more, the deeper the tool set that we have, the better we are able to go and solve problems. And it's, the, it's not good to go and re keep your tool set small. It's good to go and increase it by learning other programming languages and other paradigms of programming. And because you never know when you're going to get this insight that's going to go and make the problem you're working on, even if you're just you know, doing a simple website, you, know, you're gonna, you may, from some experience you have, find a, a, a more concise, better way of going and solving a problem. So for me, I was fascinated to go and see that this is the way it's done, right? And now I have something in my mental toolkit about how to solve problems, and maybe it comes up at some point, right? I become a more powerful programmer by going and knowing these things. So to me, that's the fascinating thing with this. And um, towards that end, what I've done is I've started going and creating a, um, a GitHub repository listed up there. Where I'm creating this little gem called JOP, and it stands for J Operations. And what it does is it basically goes and adds on to monkey patches onto arrays, um, uh, a, a method called J, and you just give it a string, and it contains text of the operations in the J programming language, and you can apply them to, to arrays and just go ahead and get arrays back. So you can do things to arrays and get them back. And um, yeah, some powerful operations. I mean, a lot of them are things that we know how to do already, right? It's like we have, we have functions to go and do like sorting and, you know, and reversing arrays and stuff like that. Um, but there's other ones that are pretty powerful that we just never think about. Like there's one called select. And what it does is it's like you basically go ahead and give it, you take an array and you give it an array of positions and it goes and gives you back all the things that are in those positions. It's like, you know, you usually have to do something more involved when you're working in Ruby to go and do something like that, right? Um, so just having that kind of powerful array operation can help you out with various things. Um, so it's, it's been a fun thing going and writing the operations in Ruby to go and do this sort of thing. One thing I think is utterly beautiful about this that I just want to kind of pass along to you as an implementation note. Remember that thing we were doing where we were constructing multidimensional arrays and it's like you give it a sequence and it's like, oh, if the sequence is less than the number of elements in the array, it just repeats itself over and over again, right? When you sit there and think, gee, how do I do that? How would I go and set it up so that um, you know, I have this you know, three by three by three thing, and I'm going to give it ones and zeros and ones over and over and over again? Turns out in Ruby, that's just so simple because we have um, there's a method called cycle okay, on enumerable, which basically goes and gives you an enumerator that cycles through things over and over and over again. And we can just go ahead and use each on that to go and get the enumerator. So I just basically go and give that enumerator to the thing that's filling up the array. And it's like, okay, well, when you get to the end of that, just cycle back through it again. And it's kind of cool that we have that kind of power available to us in Ruby if we're aware of it, right? Okay. Um, otherwise, writing this, you know, just using the standard tools you have in regular programming would be a real pain in the butt. I think it would just really bother me. Um, 
so there's that. Uh, there are resources online for the J programming language. There's a really cool reference card that goes and gives you, you know, all the operations and things you can do. Um, I, I just encourage you guys to go and sort of dig into this sort of thing. It's, uh, uh, you become a more powerful programmer because of that. Um, the other thing I'm playing with right now also is uh, just <laughs> the recognition that the syntax is going to freak people out. You know, I mean, that's just obvious. And when you look at the... Um, when you look at the legacy of the APL languages, the first thing they did is they invented this crazy character set. And then the J programming language came along and it's like, okay, let's just use the ASCII characters. There's another language called K, and I think the most current one now is called Q. And um, it basically goes and uses you know, words in order to go and sort of like describe the pieces of things that you go and need to do. And this is all kind of like moving closer and closer to just basically making things you know, really understandable by your average programmer and stuff like that. Um, to me, the array operations are the thing that's, things that are powerful. So I started going and adding into this the ability to go and start going and saying, hey, you know, this dot rotate dot factorial dot and, you know, just chain the operations together to go and do these powerful things and uh, drop the crazy syntax. But it feels like you should be able to use this, the crazy syntax if you want to. So anyway, I don't know where this is going, but this has been something I've been kind of playing with for a while. I wanted to share it with you guys because I think if nothing else, I want you guys to go and get the sense that um, it's not just, hey, we've mastered object orientation. It's like we're, we're dabbling in functional programming now. There are further directions to go in, right? There are far more powerful programming languages out there. And to the degree that we know these things, you know, we're way better as programmers. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder about this, too. I just wonder, um, oh, God, what's the anecdote I heard about this? Yeah, I was reading about this the other day that, uh, I think it was on Hacker News, somebody going in saying that, you know, they've done studies now, and they kind of figure that kids in second and third grade can learn calculus, okay? That they can learn the fundamentals of calculus. It's like you can explain integration by going in and sort of like having rectangles going in, getting smaller and smaller inside of, a, you know, like a, a shape, you know, like you're, you're calculating area by going in and using thinner and thinner slices. You can explain derivatives with, you know, just like tangent lines and stuff like that. And there's a lot of things about calculus that are just really... They're intuitive once you see the picture, right? It's just the formulas that freak us out, right? And I think that with calculus, what happened is that with such a, a late development in mathematics, 1700s and stuff, that everybody figures you have to know all that other stuff before you get to calculus. Same thing is happening with programming, right? I think if you teach people Scheme or Haskell as the first language in school, it's natural to them, and they're not scared of it because you haven't made them scared of it. And the same thing is true of APL and J and stuff like that. It's like Chinese, right? It's not scary if that's what you grow up with, right? So I, I wouldn't be surprised to see in 20 years see abstractions that we see in these languages, these APL derivatives, common mainstream things within our programming. And, um, you know, if, you, if you're interested in going doing this sort of thing, try it out. You know, contribute, you know, fork the repository, play around with it, talk to me. Um, I'd love to work with you on it. So we forget how much abstraction we can currently handle, and we can definitely handle more. So, um, yeah, thank you guys. And, uh, yeah. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Questions? Or is everybody's mind so blown that <laughs> you don't have questions? No. Uh, thanks for the presentation uh, and the uh, tools. Uh, First thing that comes to my mind is whether those operations can be done in parallel, like, or even, you know, if it's math and big arrays on uh, graphics card and you know, stuff like that. Did yeah, you think about there's, that? there's a lot of opportunity for parallelization. I don't know what the state of the art is with that sort of thing. Um, the thing about these APL derivatives is they tend to be used in little niche areas of, like, people doing uh, financial computations, like at big, you know, banks and... Uh, you know, actuarial work for insurance people, just people who are heavily mathematical. And I've heard about people going and doing, like, you know, these kinds of things in a parallel context. The thing I want to go and make, get across with this is that, um, you remember that thing with Conway's life where you've got the matrix of, like, nine things, and you say, okay, get these things, and then go and sum them downward through all that stuff? It looks like a terribly expensive operation, right? But the fact is that there's been an incredible amount of work that's been done to tune these things and optimize. And it's like that... You know, imagine that rotate operation, rotating an array. You don't have to take an array and shift the entire thing if you can create, like, another object which goes and maps the indices for you, right? So imagine you rotate something by one layer. You can have another thing which is kind of like, okay, this thing goes from 0 to n. 
and it kind of maps down into that thing and does the rotation for you automatically. You can do a lot of things in place by going and using shuffling around indices inside of memory. And so the real implementations that are done for these kinds of languages do all these indices shifting games so they don't have to copy things as much as we might assume. And in general, these things tend to be immutable as well, so you can have that benefit of doing things. Um, the, thing, the only thing that pisses me off, really, about this is that uh, J is it's open source, but I think you need a commercial license. Well, no, it's not open source. The source is available, but you need a, a license to use it commercially. Um, this has been a, such a niche area that I don't think that there's any, anything which is like a fully open source implementation of any one of these languages. And I think that's what it's going to take for some kind of acceptance. You know? so. um, while it is good to write concise code with few lines, um, how do you feel about debugging this? Won't it become a nightmare? Because it's, it gets harder and harder to test that specific part of code if it's just one line. And Who's speaking? I can't see. I'd like to see who I'm speaking to. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and how do you get, go about testing that, 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 that kind of code? How do you go about testing that kind of code? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just you, it's, it's very much like the same thing we're confronted with functional programming, right? You have to understand how the pieces are and then how they compose together and what to to do with each one of those things. I, I don't see it as a big problem that way. You know, I think the thing is, more than anything else, this lends itself to um, you can piece something together quickly and you know, write tests and see that you're getting the right values out of it. I don't see, I think, I think part of it for us is the unfamiliarity of it. Um, I'll never forget, I worked at a biomedical company back in the 1990s, early 1990s, and we had one guy there who was, didn't want us to use C++ because he was scared of virtual functions. Okay, and you know, he was scared because he's like, wow, you call that method, and you have no idea which method's being invoked at all, right? And he would talk about the, the, the combinatorial explosion of, um, of uh, you know, paths you would have to go and take in testing because of this, this uh, you know, ability to have virtual functions. And it's like, you know, but in the industry, we've gotten used to that sort of thing, and it's, you know, it's practical that way. So, um, yeah, I, I, don't, I think it might be a bit of a non-issue. So. Uh, a comment on one of your last statements, like, uh, um, do you believe that we need uh, to learn better how to learn languages? In the sense that not to have that fear you are talking about, that it seems like a common pattern, like, uh, yeah. uh, depending on how you start to learn programming languages, you tend to have a sort of fear for new things. Do yeah. you think that we need to improve uh, on this kind of... I, I think so. But I think, I think a lot of it's happening naturally. I know, you know, now a lot of development, you know, when you look at a lot of what's happening is, you know, very uh, uh, high-profile development these days. It's like app development, iOS and Android and stuff like that, where the languages are kind of regularized. But I know we went through, we've gone through a big period with web development where basically to be, be a web developer, you need to know four or five different languages, even if they're just markup, right? need to know that sort of thing. So people are getting used to being polyglot in the industry. And that's, um, that's powerful. I, uh, I don't know of any skill for going and acquiring new languages other than taking the, um, the plunge and just learning a second language. There's that book, um, there's the Seven Programming Languages in Seven Days, you know, which is kind of like trying to push that idea of like, here's, you know, here's an, you know, something else you should learn. Um, I just want to add one other thing to that too. That I, I, one of the things I've found in the industry that's extremely powerful is when you have people who become full stack developers, right? And uh, those are the people I respect the most in the industry. Um, people who basically, they understand how microcode works, they understand how assembly language works, they understand the processor they're working on, they understand the VM, they know how a VM works, they understand the language they're working in, then they understand you know, the, the frameworks they're using, then they understand the business that they're in, fully the domain and stuff like that, right? And um, I've been privileged or happy in to work with some organizations where they attempt to basically go and get developers to do that kind of thing, to understand it all the way up and down. You become so valuable for that, you know, and uh, I think uh, it's like anything else in life that, you know, learning your second language is hard, learning your third one is easier, learning your fourth one. You just have to kind of like push past the fear, you know? And I think, you know, maybe, maybe that's the thing in the industry is to go and have more examples of people doing that sort of thing and make it feel approachable to people, you know? So, yeah. Uh, what about the performance of, of this thing? 
Uh, I mean, uh, sooner or later it will be transformed in in some more complicated way than that this because it has to be um, processed by the processor. So my question is, uh, will <coughs> it be faster in the way of performance if I will write it myself? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I know that, like, a, and I don't know what the absolute performance is, but I know that. Um, that in that segment of the industry where people are doing this sort of thing, they've done an awful lot of work to go and optimize these things. And again, it becomes that thing of like shuffling indices around rather than copying things and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I'm sure there are certain things that um, performance is going to be you know, lousy at and you have to kind of figure out whether it's suited for your particular problem or not. Um, an example, like Conway's life, right? It's like this is a, this is a bit of a space uh, expensive thing because you have to have a full grid that you're using. And um, I know that some Conway's life implementations will use like a, a data structure which allows it to be sparse. You don't have to have a full grid. And if you had like a giant life simulation, you probably wouldn't want to have a thousand by a thousand thing. It would be much slower in one of these languages than it would be if you were doing it using, you know, a sparse data structure, right? It's trade-offs, you know? Um, but again, as I was saying earlier, it just comes down to what's your toolbox? If you have a toolbox where you can basically say, hey, this is good for this problem, let me go ahead and do this. Um, one thing I've done that I think is kind of fascinating that's not related to this, but it's kind of neat, is I taught myself Haskell you know, a long time ago. And it's like I find that sometimes prototyping in Haskell to go and figure out whether I can do something or solve a problem in a particular way has been powerful because I'm like able to go and rather quickly get something going. But I know I'm not going to roll Haskell into production. But I have something which kind of proves out the solution. It's like, okay, now I know that it's going to work. I'm like, Ah, I'm relaxed, and they can code it up in Ruby or something else, right? And if you're working with a team of people that understand these operations, you can say, well, yeah, this is just a, a projection, and then rotate and take a determinant and do this, and it's like, T -t 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 -t. run some test cases, like, yeah, 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 it works, okay, okay. Let's go and run, run off and write it in C or in Ruby or whatever, right? Um, for me, that's the hardest part of programming sometimes, is like, okay, you're marching, you're marching, you're marching, and is the whole thing gonna fit together? Is it all gonna work? It's like, okay, do that little bit of work in the beginning to go and understand that it's going to work, and then go ahead and do the thing that you need to go and do. So, yeah. so um, mm, when it comes to like more concise languages, do you think it's possible that we could call uh, we could go into the direction of domain-specific languages that are like uh, have a really small uh, f domain and solve uh, like small small problems, but are really good at that, so they might. Uh, cause less problems or something like that. Yeah. So I read some time ago about an uh, operating system that was supposed to be written in like a ridiculous small amount of code, and thanks to uh, like splitting tasks into domain-specific languages. So, what do you think about that? It's um, probably yeah, I, th I think it's it's a powerful approach. The the thing that you always have to go and sort of pay attention to is that there's a maintenance cost to having a DSL, um, and uh, it has to be worth it. And, um, uh, but yeah, in many cases it is. I think the best DSLs I've seen have been in like a stable domain where you're writing the same kind of program over and over and over again. So you, you get the payoff from going and doing that sort of thing over and over and over again, and you have those higher levels of abstraction. It's, very, it's roughly the same idea, right? More concise stuff. Uh, a lot of times people think that DSLs are going to use like natural language words in a way to go and do their work, but it doesn't have to be that way either. Um, there's a, a great book uh, God, I can't remember exactly. It's Haskell and Multimedia, learning Haskell through Multimedia. And it has a DSL for going and doing music composition, but they define new operators to go and sort of like put one row of tones above another and stuff like that. It looks very mathematical. It's a DSL, but it's not using, it's not using natural language. It's not using English. It's using symbols. So the thing I'm saying is that like you can look at J as being a DSL for array processing in a way. You know, you, the symbolism is not the thing that differentiates DSLs from stuff. So. Uh, I guess I sort of have a follow-up question to that because I was wondering, because the APL seems to be uh, vector and let's say number-based, and I'm wondering, do you, are you aware of languages that maybe take a similar approach but uh, assume different axioms, maybe like sets or trees or state machines or regexes or something like that? Um, not offhand for those. I mean, you know, Lisp is Lisp, right? There's a there's an old language called Icon, which is all about strings. Everything is a string, if I remember correctly. Um, as far as tree-based, I don't know. 
you know. Um, yeah, but I think it's a very you know interesting area to pick your elemental data structure and build a language around it. Um, there has to be something in the set domain like that. I just don't know offhand what it is. But yeah, powerful idea. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Sure. <laughs>